Hello and good evening to you all. Uh, I am your host, Caroline, and welcome to our IVF webinar once again. Uh, just as always, please let me know that you can hear me uh, clearly and without any interruptions, uh, just making sure perhaps some of you already had a chance to, to join us at 6 p.m. Uh, UK time. We had some troubles. Uh, we were not able to finish it, but uh, now everything is working. Uh, Dr. Raul is already with us. Hi, Dr. Raul. Can you hear me? Hi. Yes, very well. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for confirming that. So mm -hmm. very um uh, we can start our IVF webinar and just a few words about our Stronger Together initiative. We are gathering here every single day so that you can find out a bit on uh, different topics on IVF treatment, but also you can meet the top experts from the fertility um, fields and of course ask your own questions. So this is all for you and we are able to go ahead with this uh, initiative also thanks to um It seems that Caroline is having some problems. She's trying to log it again. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I don't know why she has now it seems that she's she has logged in again. Hi, I hope yes. <laughs> Apologies. I was worried that something happened again. We had some issues, but I am back, so don't worry. I am sorry for that. I'm not really sure what happened, but I am back, and I do see that you can hear me, so all is okay. Okay, so I was saying uh, that uh, that we are meeting here every day, and uh, for this is our Stronger Together initiative, and it's all possible thanks to our ambassadors and partners. You can see all of them right here. Uh, right now so uh, of course some of them you might already know if not uh, i believe there will be more uh, there will be more for sure uh, events coming up so you will have a chance to still meet them okay and uh, now as i've mentioned with us today is dr raul olivares and he's uh, the medical director at barcelona ivf in spain and of course he today will present a topic on ivf for patients beyond their 40s and we will start with the presentation. Dr. Raul will be talking about uh, this topic. And after that, we will go for Q&A session. Uh, so you will be able to type all of your questions in the chat section. And Dr. Raul will answer them for you. So you can prepare them during the presentation or afterwards. Uh, and we will definitely uh, will be showing those uh, as well. OK, and now I believe that would be it from me at this point and i believe we can start with our presentation here dr raul hi again hi. Uh, all is working so don't worry i am yeah. here <laughs> and uh, are you ready to start with your yeah. presentation yeah, yeah no problem i can Perfect. start thanks go ahead thank you caroline for your kind words and thank you y'all for for uh, joining our virtual meeting today especially given the the hard time that we are currently living um it's also a very difficult time for us because uh, though being part of the health system our medicine is not so urgent like other fields nowadays so uh, we hope to go back to work as soon as possible because it would also mean good news in for for um, in terms of uh, that this um pandemic is uh, is will be over 
Okay, so um, we are going to talk about IBF in patients beyond their forties, and the reason to for choosing this this topic is because uh, and probably you are aware of that, but um, the, the motherhood is being delayed um, across the world. You know, uh, people is uh, doing a, a lot of things during their life, and uh, the fact of having children is becoming, I wouldn't say less and less important, but it's something that is is always being postponed and postponed. That means that the majority of the patients that we have are in the late 30s and probably as much as half of the patients that we currently have our clinic are over 40. And so most of the patients when they are in their 40 are healthy, look gorgeous, practice sport, play sports, and have a really very rich life. The problem is that the ovaries keep doing their work and, and uh, something that has taken years and years to develop like this window of uh, fertility window that patients have, which is between 20 and 35 years, is not going to change in one generation. So we have to deal with issues that make uh, slightly more, slightly or sometimes really quite hard def um, to, to be successful. So what I'm going to explain to you is how we treat patients when they are over 40, because in some cases we need to do special things in order to identify which are the patients that can still be treated, in order to decide how are we going to treat them, what the laboratory can offer to take care of those valuable embryos, and also very important sometimes is how to identify identify which embryos can become babies. So uh, the first thing, just give me one second. One of the most important things that we have to, to, to explain is that uh, one thing is ovarian reserve and another thing is egg quality, okay? Um, unfortunately, there are, time, there are uh, occasions in which they go together. But um, ovarian reserve means the capacity of the ovaries to produce follicles and eggs. And this sometimes has to do with the quality and sometimes it does not. If you see this slide, is a quite old study carried out in the, in the UK, in which you can see that if you want to have a 15% life birth, if you are between 18 and 34 years, you only need two eggs. And with this two eggs, you should reach that 15%. While if you are over 40, you may need up to 15 eggs to have the same chances. So in this case, you here, this is the number of eggs is the ovarian reserve, which means the amount of eggs that an ovaries can produce. And the age is directly related to the quality of the eggs. So this is why sometimes it's important to understand that someone with a low ovarian reserve, like with a low AMH, with a low antral follicle count, we will see later that these are the tools that we usually use to identify which patients are okay. With a low AMH may produce one or two lovely eggs enough to get pregnant even naturally. And sometimes patients with 42, 43 years old may produce up to 10, 12, or 13 eggs, but of poor quality. And therefore the quality of the embryos is also going to be bad and the chances are not going to be that, that good. Obviously, if we have the problem that someone is over 40 and has a low ovarian reserve, everything becomes really tough because if we cannot increase the number of eggs, it's going to be very difficult to help these kind of patients. Age is important because if you see this other slide, when you are 41, half 50% of the patients, this point of here, are going to be infertile just because of the age with nothing else. So no other problem. The age itself is going to cause this fertility problem. So the thing is that uh, age is very, very well related to the quality of the eggs that you are going to have. And which are the bumps in the road? Which are the problems that these patients are going to have? First of all, they may have a reduced number of follicles, so a low ovarian reserve, which is going to make, is going to, uh, make very difficult to get a good number of eggs. 
There is also a reduced sensibility of the follicles to the FSH. The FSH are the hormones that we use to stimulate. So despite using uh, high doses, the responses of these follicles is going to be lower. And this sometimes help us understand why patients who may have a lot of small follicles, uh, we see that th these follicles do not grow. So they remain, they remain small. And this is because of this reduced sensibility. There is high risk of anatomic abnormalities. This is not directly related with the, with the ovaries, but as you get older, there, are, there is a higher risk of having fibroids, of having polyps, or having other issues of having endometriosis, which is a disease that can reduce the ovarian reserve. So there are other conditions that may help to get it, to make it worse. There is a higher risk of genetic issues in the oocytes. It's, it's well known that patients over 40 have a higher risk of miscarriage, a higher risk of Down syndrome. And this is basically due to the quality of the eggs. The older the egg is, the higher the risk that it may have some genetic abnormality that can increase the risk of miscarriage. There are higher risk of cytoplasmic issues. The cytoplasm is the, the, um, and the, the liquid that surrounds the nucleus of the eggs. And it's important for example, to produce the energy uh, through the mitochondria that the eggs need to uh, develop. And, and, and also it's very important for the early stages of the embryo because the embryo in the two first, first days of life um, lives from what it gets from the egg. So if the mitochondria are not okay, this is going to make very difficult the cell division and may, and may lead to a blockage of that embryo. And there is a higher risk of epigenetic problems in all sets due to the DNA methylation errors. This is something that is age related and it may affect other, other, other aspects of the, of the, of the oocyte that can also uh, entail problems, especially in the evolution of the embryos. So, as I said at the beginning of the, of the, of the lecture, uh, these are the critical questions that I'm going to try to to answer. One is if it's possible to identify which patients are still on time to use their eggs. If, if stimulation protocols can change the prognosis, what can be done in the lab to take care of those vulnerable embryos and how can we identify those embryos that could become babies? So going back to the initial slide, uh, these are the patients that we need to identify. Well, this is a slightly it should be slightly low, um, below because what we, we, we need to, to, to identify are those patients that can produce a good number of eggs, okay? Because if you have a good ovarian reserve and you have more eggs, more eggs mean more embryos, more embryos, higher chances of finding that embryo that can become a baby. So we need to identify which are the patients that can be put in this, in this area. And for doing that, we have two different, different uh, tests. One is uh, checking the AMH, the anti mullerian hormone, which as you can see is inversely related to the age. The older the patient is, the lower the AMH is. And also uh, we can do a scan to count the number of small follicles. These are also called antral follicles. Without these follicles that can be recruited if we stimulate the patients. If you see this in the scan, it is very different from that, in which that patient only have two small follicles, small ovaries, nothing else. This one may produce a lot of, a lot of follicles, okay? So AMH, antral follicle count are the most useful tools. And this is confirmed by a lot of studies. For example, this is a and another study that uh, wants to wanted to assess the predictive value of antral follicle count and serum antimullerian hormone in patients over 40 for their first IVF treatment to see if, if even before they had the first attempt, there was a, a way of identifying or trying to foresee the prognosis. And though this is a slightly move, age antral follicle count and anti mullerian hormone are all significant. So there are ways, basal FSH, which was a traditional way of checking the ovarian reserve, is, is not so useful. It has a very, very big variations between the cycles. So we stick to antral follicle count and anti mullerian to identify those patients that can produce a lot of eggs. This is another study in which checks more than 2,000 consecutive cycles of IVF 
in patients over 40. Again, I'm sorry for that uh, because I've checked the, 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 the slides, but uh, I've not noticed that this is moved because this is basically here the cancellation rate. As you can see, as patients get older, the cancellation rate is very high. And this is very important in order to know, um, especially with regards to the statistics, okay? Because sometimes you see, well, if we can transfer you, you can have a 20, 30% chance of getting pregnant. But the main problem that we have in this group of patients is that most of the time patients do not even reach the egg collection. So when we talk about what are the chances, well, we need to offer these patients or we have to inform is about what are the chances of having a baby if you start an IVF? Not if we get eggs, not if we reach the embryo transfer, not a positive. I mean, the, the only statistic that is really useful is live birth per started cycle. As you can see that in patients 44, 45, 30%, up to half of them do not even reach the egg collection. And what happens when, they, when, we, when we can transfer? Well, the miscarriage rate goes up, 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 up to 75, 70% of the patients who get pregnant have miscarriages and the deliveries drop very, very dramatically from 72, 40 with a 10%, 7%, 5% life birth per initiated cycle, uh, less than 1% once you are over 43, 0 0.7, 0 0.5. Okay, so you can see that uh, with regards to age, and this is another study that basically uh, get half patients uh, 43 or older, live birth when you are 43, 10%, 44, 3. But once you are 45 or older, the live birth is close to 0%. And only very, very few studies, uh, if I'm not wrong, so because, okay which fits very well in, in, with the statistics of the American system. In the American registry, you can see the, the triangles are the pregnancies, but the, these squares are the single infant live births. As you can see that once you are 44 and over, it basically it is zero, okay? So um, what happens, because we see that we are trying to identify which patients are suitable or are good enough to be or to have an IVF. But what happens if we don't succeed in the first attempt? It is worth to try again. Do we have to cancel and, and check and choose a, an egg donation? This is why this, this study is really, really very, very nice because basically shows that when you are 40 and if you have treatments, with each treatment that you have, you are slightly increasing the so-called cumulative live birth rate. It means the, 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 the probability of having a child either in your first attempt or your second attempt or your third attempt. And this basically increases up to up to five, six IVF. I wouldn't recommend five, six IVF in someone, but that's something that can be done in some cases. When you are 42, exactly the same at a lower level, Okay, you can see that the chances are increasing, increasing, but once you are 43, 44, 45, this is a flat line. So basically what happens in the first cycle is going to be very, um, a very good example of what you can ex expect in the second, in the third, on the fourth attempt. So you can consider more than one treatment if you are 40, 41, probably 42, but once you are 44, 45, you can try once if you think that it's it's worth trying, but if it does not work, it is not it is uh, really not recommended to go through another round of IBA because the chances of success are going to be very low. So, uh, with regards to identifying patient, there's no way to assess the real quality of the oocytes other than undergoing an IBF. Okay, so the only thing that we can do is identify those patients that may produce a good number of eggs, but we are not going to get any clue, any hint about their quality, the quality of the eggs, until we do the egg collection and we check how good the eggs are and how good are the embryos that these eggs produce. AMH and antral follicle count seem to be the best tools to identify patients with good prognosis, along with the number of previous treatments. So uh, if, if you are just trying to, 
to find out if this patient uh, can do a first IBF, AMH, and follicle count. In some cases with a good AMH, if the patient has already tried two, three, four times, probably it is not a good idea to go ahead and carry more treatments because the results are not going to be good. IBF using on X once you are 44 makes no sense of, or I would say it makes very little sense because the, as you have seen, the chances are very low in terms of having a baby, which is the only thing that we are interested on, getting having babies. So you can have good responses, you can have, you can have uh, uh, produce eggs, but the chances that any of these embryos created from these eggs is going to be a baby are going to be very low. Uh, there are some exceptions anyway. Okay, for example, because um, this uh, basically I've been talking about patients who have been trying to conceive and they have failed. So there is kind of an infertility background. So it is like there is a problem. And most of the time, the problem is related to the quality of the eggs. But what happens if someone with no partner who has not ever tried to get pregnant wants to see if just because she's 43, 44, want to have a baby? Uh, either because she, she is a lesbian couple, she's single, or there is a very severe main factor. Uh, let's say, for example, that the partner has a vasectomy in which uh, the chances of getting pregnant naturally are zero if they don't do anything. Well, in these cases, since the start point is different, we don't, we don't start with patients that have fertility issues. They have patients that are want to try uh, to see if they can conceive. If this, this limit of 44 sometimes can be pass and we can try if they have a good ovarian reserve with an at least one one attempt to see uh, if uh, if it's possible to to succeed so uh once we have the patient how are we going to treat them you know when we, with regards to the stimulation protocols there are two different things that have been always on on um that we've had a lot of discussion about it is one is if we can increase the outside quality Honestly, I think that we don't have any protocol, any vitamin, any substance that can improve quality of the egg. So far, no study has ever proved to, 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 to have any benefit from taking antioxidants, minocetol, DHA, and things like that. And that's the evidence, and there have been a lot of a lot of testing and testing and studies. And the only thing that we can do with our current protocols is to try to get as many eggs as we can, just uh, hoping that among those eggs we are going to get the right one that is going to produce the healthy embryo. And in order to increase the quantity of the oocytes, there are different things that we have been proposed. One is to increase the dose uh, of the drugs. Another thing is to use a new generation of drugs like Dialumba. And in some cases, it has been suggested to add androgens at the beginning of the cycle. And we are going to see the evidence that we have of uh, each of these different protocols. With regards, uh, in, in any case, uh, first, I would like to, to explain you why it's so important to have as many eggs as we can. Because for many, for many years, we have been working with mild protocols because the people who were uh, using those protocols were claiming that at some point, if we get too many eggs, the quality of those eggs is not going to be good. So it is not worth to stimulate very hard patients because at, uh, once we get six, seven, eight good eggs, the quality of the, of the remaining are not going to be good. So we have this, this study very interesting carried out four years ago, in which it was very clearly demonstrated, in my opinion, that the more eggs you produce, the higher the cumulative life birth is. Um, going just, I will, I will spend five, a few seconds talking about the statistics again, because this is a very interesting concept, cumulative life birth, and basically means the chances of getting pregnant with any, any of the embryos that we create in a single cycle, in a single cycle. So nowadays we are not so focused on being successful on the first attempt. Of course, if we can, that would be great for, for patients and for, for the clinic. But sometimes 
we are focused on being successful with one of the embryos. And if you don't get pregnant with the first, you may get pregnant with the second or the third. This is why it's so important to have as many embryos as possible. So the cumulative birth, live birth, is directly related to the number of eggs that you produce. If you produce four to nine oocytes, your chances of getting pregnant is going to be 40%. If you produce more than 15 oocytes, it's going to be 61.5. Maybe not in the first attempt, but probably also in the first attempt, because the more embryos you have, the higher the chances that you can choose a really good one between them. So uh, the, the, the cumulative birth, the odds radio, I mean, if you produce more than 15 eggs, your chances of getting or having a baby are going to be 5.6 um, times higher than some ones who produce zero to three oocytes. This is why it's so important to carry out uh, what we call and basically, you know, the, the, I cannot um, perform the animation of this slide, but the M was supposed to um, to turn, and instead of mild stimulation, I would recommend a wild stimulation because the the the, the idea is to try to get as many eggs as we can. Another important factor in these patients is that if we get a lot of eggs and we get a lot of embryos, we may be in the position of freezing embryos. And that's very, very important, especially in cases in which the couples want to have a sibling in the future. Because if you have problems to get pregnant when you are 41, and you have your pregnancy and you deliver and you come back in two years, once you are 43, 44, you have already seen what is gonna happen. Your chances are going to fall dramatically. So if somehow we can freeze embryos when you are 41, these embryos, when you come back for a second baby, are going to offer you my, much higher chances than if you try with your own eggs at 43. So this is a, a message that I probably am gonna be like a hammer. Repeating it, repeating it very, very uh, a lot of a lot of time. Um, the more eggs we get, the better for the patients. So, uh, as we have said, there are three different ways, or we suggest three different ways of trying to obtain more eggs. The traditional one has been increasing the doses of the stimulations, but there is a lot of a lot of evidence that the higher the doses are, the poorer the quality of the eggs is. And this is something that was confirmed that this large, large study that included more than 650,000 cycles, and that was very able, very likely, uh, was um, very, uh, basically they confirmed, sorry for that, they confirmed that, you see, for a um, similar amount of eggs, let's say the, the good prognosis, no, more than 15 eggs, the higher the doses, where, I mean, if you compare uh, the, the amount of drugs that were used to obtain 15 eggs, in this case, between 150 units and third 300 units per day, compared to more than 450, you can see that the pregnancy rate is almost uh, double when you use lower doses. So the easier that, I that it is to get these eggs, the higher the chances. As I've said, um, I, I as I usually say to my patients, sometimes it's very difficult that we can improve the quality of the eggs. But if we don't work properly, correctly, we can make it worse because if we use very strong protocols and the same happens for this group, age over 40, you can see that the, the pregnancy rates when you use high doses protocol, like more than 450 or 17 compared to the 25, 25 that you have when you use lower protocol. So the idea is that we do not recommend going beyond 300 units because it's going to be a waste of uh, drugs, a waste of money. And on top of that, we can make it worse by impairing the quality of the eggs. The other option that we have is using new gonadotropines like the Alomba. The Alomba is a drug that I really like very much because it has different advantages. I have to say that this drug is available in almost all Europe and except on the UK. Um, I don't know exactly why, because one of the teams that helped to develop the drug was, was located in, in Sheffield, but currently it's not available in the UK. Um, why is so good the Lomba, in my opinion? Um, you can see that we are now working with this concept of follicle output rate. 
okay? The follicle output rate means the capability of the drug of making all those small follicles grow, okay? As you see in the one of the first slides, one of the problems that we, we, that we have in, in, in patients over 40 is that there is a reduced sensibility to the FSH, which sometimes causes that small follicles do not grow. And you have like five, six, seven small follicles and only one, two grow. Well, the LOMBA claims to have the best follicle output rate, the so-called FORD. It means that it really makes all or a lot of small follicles grow, which is a good thing. And why is that drug doing that? Okay, this is how a normal protocol with daily injections works. There is a threshold that you need to reach in order to effectively recruit follicles. And when you take daily injections, you may need up to three, four days that you are taking injections, but you are not getting any effect at all. Uh, with, uh, with the lumbar, which is the green curve, you will see that you reach, you reach that threshold on day one, and with the doses of 150, you have a much stronger a stimulation at the very beginning of the cycle, which helps a lot to recruit those small follicles that you have at the beginning. Okay. The other advantage of the of the Elomba is if you see this is how the FSH and LH behave in the natural cycle. Okay, the LH with the surge that it triggers the ovulation, and the FSH. As you can see, this curve is much more similar to the normal curve of the FSH than this one. So another benefit of this drug is that it has a, a very similar profile to the, F, to, the, to the one that the FSH has in the natural cycle, which may be good for the follicles. And the third advantage is that it is very comfortable because the Alomva is an injection that stimulates you for up to seven days. So there is no need to take injections on a daily basis. So you have a drug that stimulates faster and stronger in a more physiological way and in a more comfortable way for the for the patients. So it's, this is this drug is currently my first uh, option when I have to treat not only patients over forty, but I think that it could make a difference in this patient, especially in those that have a good antral follicle count, but they don't um, they don't have too many follicles on the day of the egg collection. The third way of trying to increase the stimulation of the number of follicles is adding androgens. The androgens are claimed to be very important in the early stages, from uh, especially going from the preantral to the antral follicles, because these antral follicles are the ones that we can recruit if we stimulate. Okay, so if we can increase this, uh, the number of preantral follicles that become antral, we may have a more antral follicles available and we may, may uh, using the alumba, we may get more, more eggs in the end, okay? Uh, this is something that was observed that um, in younger patients have a, a higher intra-ovarian levels of androgens. So the protocol basically does, it uh, works like this, you know? We use testosterone, okay, so really androgens, not DNA, DHA, testosterones that are added either in patches or in a cream in the first days of the stimulation. So we usually work with the lung protocol uh, in which uh, once the patient has uh, her period, we add androgens for a few days, and then we start the stimulation with any FSH, either gonal or, or a lomba, if it's the case. And by doing that, there are some studies that have improved the ovarian response in low responders, okay? This can also be used in younger patients, but is a good way of increasing the number of antral follicles and therefore the number of follicles that grow. Uh, now, Caroline, you want to, to launch the video because now I'm going to talk about what we can do in the time lapse. Uh, in the laboratory, the thing that we can do is um, using this new generation of incubators called time lapse. Also, there are different brands, Gary, Embryoscope. Uh, because they have different, uh, some advantages compared to the traditional ones. As you can see, these are incubators has a, a camera that takes a picture every 15 minutes. And with these images, 
we can assess the quality of the embryos without having to take them out from the incubator. So we don't disturb them, uh, uh, we don't disturb them at all during the five days that we keep them in culture. Uh, we can also make a video that help us to uh, understand when do they divide and how they divide, which is something that's very interesting because that's some functional information to the morphology. Okay. Uh, and also um, increases the quality of the embryo. So it's a, it's a tool that basically give because of the, the conditions, because it's probably the closest system to the uterus that we have, that we currently have in the lab, because of the, of the close monitoring of, the, of this precise monitoring of the embryos, we have more blastocysts and we can choose a better blastocyst because this selection is not only going to be made uh, based on the morphology and how pretty, how ugly the embryo is on day five. And as you can see, this is confirmed by the results that we have. Uh, this is uh, our data from 2017 and 18. Uh, we have a higher percentage of blastocysts if we were uh, when we use time lapse. We have a higher uh, pregnancy rates, but the ongoing pregnancy rates significantly much better when when we use these uh, these incubators. So it's something that I would recommend, especially in those cases in which you don't have a lot of embryos and you don't want to disturb them at all. If we uh, check the results uh, by, different, by different groups, you can see that 40 to 42, the ongoing is 32, 43 to 44 is 9%. That means uh, this is not live birth, it's ongoing pregnancy rate, some of them miscarriage. But once we are over 45, there are not so many cases, of course, but despite having some pregnancies, no one, no one ever become a baby. Okay, so, but any, any, anyway, anyway, 32.1 uh, of ongoing pregnancy in patients between 40 and 42 is a good pregnancy rate. Uh, how are we going to identify suitable embryos? Okay, because one thing is, as I've seen, uh, if you remember one of the initial slides, uh, another of the main problems that we have had, that we have with these patients is that as they get older, there, are, there is a higher and higher risk of having genetic issues. And if you compare these two graphics, uh, in which you see here is the life birth rate. This is the miscarriage, the miscarriage rate. And as you can see, as you get older, the life birth decreases, the miscarriage in in increases. And if you compare that to the number of genetic issues in the embryos, you can see that they're absolutely similar, okay? The miscarriage increases, at, it increases the neoploidy, which means that the embryo is genetically abnormal, the life birth, okay, reduces at, as, as the implantation reduces because of the uh, genetic problems of the embryos. And this is also very important because especially in patients over 40, unless there is any other factor, the main reason for having an implantation failure uh, is the genetic issues in the embryos. Sometimes you see patients that they go one, two, three rounds of IBF, they have good blastocysts, at least in terms of morphology, and there is a lot of uh, people who start doing research on receptivity, immunology, coagulation. No, 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 The main problem is that these embryos, those embryos, despite looking gorgeous, may have genetic issues inside of them. And if you don't check that, you may, you may keep transferring embryos that are not going to implant regardless of how good the environment is because the problem is the embryo. And this is when PGS comes, uh, comes in, you know. Uh, PGS stands for pre-implantational genetic screening, pre-implantational genetic diagnosis. There are, there are two different ways of saying the same. And in this case, we use blastocysts, uh, we make a hole, and using a laser, you see this point that you see here, we cut and we, uh, we take four or five cells of these uh, cells of what is going to be the placenta. The, we, we usually we recommend using blastocysts because in the blastocysts we can see the inner cell mass. So this is what is going to be the embryo. And these are the cells that are going to be the placenta. So we are pretty sure that we are not damaging the embryo at all. So we take out two, three, four, five cells of this embryo, and then we do like an amniocentesis and we check the chromosomes of these embryos. 
And by doing that, we can transfer embryos in which the risk of miscarriage is going to be as low as any embryo obtained from a 27, 25 years old girl. It's going to be tough because uh, the number of suitable embryos is going to be low. But if we manage to get that healthy embryo genetically normal, the chances are going to be very, very, very good. And why it's so important? Because if you see this study included more close to 7,000 embryos, and you can see that once you are 41, 42, or even 42, the percentage of genetically normal embryos is very low. Okay, it's 10%, 13%. And this is also very interesting uh, graphic to understand the differences between ovarian reserve and quality. As you can see, the percentage of abnormal embryos remains very similar regardless of how many embryos the patients can produce. So it is not that the patient who can produce up to 10 embryos is going to have better embryos than the one who produces one or three. No, the normal embryos, the percentage of normal embryos is going to be exactly the same. The thing is that if you produce 10 embryos, this 10% is going to mean, is going to mean that you are going to have more chances of having a suitable embryo. So again, the more embryos we have, the higher the chances of having that good embryo that can become a baby. And is, if, we, if we check and we try to know if the, if, um, um, the morphology, the, uh, it's related to the genetics. Well, uh, not really. Okay, so when we transfer lovely blastocysts, top quality, they may still have genetic issues. However, we know that the prettier the embryo is, the higher the chances of being normal are. And this is basically what we get here. When the morphology is good, the number of embryos that are genetically normal are, is higher, 73%. When the morphology is poor, only 40% of these embryos are genetically normal, but they are. They're still normal embryos, okay? And with regards to the implantation rate of those genetically normal embryos, we see that once we know that that embryo is genetically normal, the morphology is no longer relevant. As you can see, implantation rate of normal embryos, when the morphology is good, 51, average 71, 466. So the, there are no difference in terms of implantation once you have tested the embryo and you see that it's genetically normal there, uh, regardless of the morphology, which is what this other study carried out in Italy shows. Okay, correlation between blastocyst morphology, euploidy, that means a genetically information, and implantation. And as you can see, the ongoing implantation rate of euploid blastocysts according to morphology, once you know that the embryo is genetically normal, does not change. When the morphology is excellent, 50, when it's good, 59, when it's average, 43, when it's poor, 53. It is gonna to be tougher to have genetically normal embryos in this group, but if you test them and the embryos are good, the pregnancy rate is gonna be as good as if the embryo is a Ferrari, no differences. This is why it's important to test all the embryos that uh, once you want to do a PGS. So, some take home messages to, to, to discuss. There's no way to deal with time. Once over 40, the sooner the better. You know, you've seen the curves, the fertility drops dramatically every six months, every three months when you are over to 42, every month once you are over 43. So don't hesitate. If you want to try, try as soon as possible. Avoid protocols with high dose of gonadotropines. Instead, use a lumbar. It's one really good option. It's comfortable, easy, and effective. Time-lapse incubators are good tools to increase the number and quality of the embryos. We are not going to disturb them. We are going to gather more information about the morphology, the, the functional, the division, and this is going to help us choose the right one. And add PGS whenever is possible. Saves time and money because there are cases in which patients may produce up to, I remember a case in which a 42 years old patient 
uh, produces 19 blastocysts in a single cycle. We did the PGS and only two embryos were genetically normal, which correlates very well with that 11%. So imagine what this patient could have invested in terms of time, money, emotions, transferring up to 19 embryos until we were lucky enough to choose and to either or to transfer those genetically normal. We discard 17 embryos, we transfer those two, the patient got pregnant and had a baby. So sometimes it's really worth investing money on doing PGS, especially when the number of embryos is very high. So it reduces the emotional burden, as I've said, and allows us to gather more information about the real quality of the embryo. Uh, once more, remember those cases of patients that produce morphologically good embryos and the, the, these embryos are transferred and you get negative miscarriages and people start investigating other factors, receptivity, uh, thrombophilias, antiphospholipid syndrome, and the problem is inside of the embryo. So before start considering considering external factors, the first thing that we have to do is identify which embryos are really good. And then if we transfer these embryos and the patient does not get pregnant, is when we can start getting worried about all factors. But implantation failure, especially in patients over 40, is mainly caused by problems in the embryos, not from anything else. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that you have uh, found this uh, speech interesting. There are other things that I could have mentioned, like why we do recommend using blastocysts instead of the three embryos, regardless of the number of embryos, because this is quite a common procedure in some places that because they are afraid that they are not gonna have embryos, they prefer to transfer sooner. And in fact, what we do prefer is to take the embryos to day five, because if the embryo is locked, at least we are going to know the reason of the failure. If we transfer on day three, and then the embryo does not make to day five, the patient may have the perception that the embryos were of good quality. But the, the, what we is true is that the, um, the most critical day for the embryos is day four to day five. This is when most of them get blocked. So transferring day three um, is not going to help. And for those who claim that if you transfer day three embryos, they are going to be in the right environment and not in the laboratory, I'm afraid that they are also wrong. Uh, the embryo on day three in the natural cycle, it is not, it is not on the endometrium. It's still in the tube where the conditions are very different. So if we are transferring a day three embryo into the endometrium, the embryo is gonna be in a strange environment that may not have the, the things that the embryo need. So whenever you can, take the embryos to day five, because this is also going to allow us to carry out a PGS. And Fantastic. that's it. I mean, Caroline? Yes, perfect. Thank you so much for that presentation, for all uh, the information. It was definitely excellent and useful, I am sure, uh, for many of our patients. Uh, but, uh, but also, thank you for those take-home messages. I am sure uh, <laughs> it's it's something that everyone will uh, will be thinking so a, about a lot of information so you have to summarize them somehow you know yep. to make that is true that is true <laughs> uh, and of course as always now it will be time for our q a session so we have a few questions ready already so let's get to it uh, straight away and let me start with the very first question is any perhaps you know is anyone doing ivf in europe now for <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the only thing that I can tell you is that uh, one of, uh, of our IBF uh, lab directors is working with the Fertility Spanish Society and uh, it, they are now developing a document um, suggesting that um, despite reproduction, maybe not an, uh, a really medicine or uh, emergency medicine, there are cases in which time is really crucial, you know. So we are aiming for the, by at the end of April, uh, to start working again, especially in those cases in which time is critical. And we all hope, I, I hope I'm not too optimistic, that uh, in May we will be able to start uh, um, treating patients, especially, as I've said, those who have a low ovarian reserve and may not be able to wait for months because this may reduce their chances. 
Another problem is how easy or how difficult it's going to be flying for the patients. This is completely out of control. And we, we are sure that well, we are pretty sure that we are going to be able to start working with the local patients. But I don't know when patients from other countries will be able to fly to our clinic, uh, hopefully sooner rather than later, but or this is what I wish. Uh, I don't know if in other countries uh, which are, have different restrictions, Eastern countries, Russia, I, I don't know if they, if they keep working, but in the main Euro, uh, um, European Union at this stage, and because of the recommendations of the European Society for Human Reproduction, all the IB, IBF labs are, have stopped working. Yes. Exactly. So, fingers crossed, it will be possible uh, in mm -hmm. May. So, yes, we we can be, we should be positive on that for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. we've waited long enough, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah. We will see, of course, how it goes. Fingers crossed. Okay. Uh, now let me uh, show you the next question right here. It's a longer one this time. I am 39. Mm. And my husband is 59 and he has got a varicocele and severe sperm mm -hmm. infertility, low motility, no formal forms. We want to go for an IVF with our own cells again. My ovarian reserve was 1.5 last April. I had a BB embryo. Implantation was successful. Clinical pregnancy, but still miscarriage week five what do you advise us both me and my husband have been tested genetically and we are uh, okay uh well um here we have a different problem because we have a male factor issue and this is something that sometimes should be studied um i i understand that when you say that you have been tested genetically it means that you've had karyotypes which is a blood test that basically checks if the chromosomes are normal or not but one thing are the chromosomes, and other things are the, 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 the DNA that you have inside the oocytes and inside of the sperm. Uh, uh, as I've explained during my speech, one of the main problems is that, that the eggs, as they get older, have more, more genetic, genetic abnormalities. Uh, the karyotype of these patients is going to be normal. The problem is going to be inside of the egg. Okay? Oh, yeah, but that means that you have been through... Exactly, but that's a carrier map test. To check if there has been if, if you are a healthy and known uh, carrier of mutations okay but usually the, the the main the main test to check if someone is genetically normal is the karyotype which basically means that if you are a woman you are 46 xx and if you are a man you are 46 xy but as i was saying the main problem is inside of the eggs so you can have a perfectly normal karyotype uh, but the karyotype means that all cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes. This is why you have 46. But there are two cells that only have 23 chromosomes, the egg and the sperm. Because when the sperm fertilizes the egg, you again have embryos that, are, that have 46 chromosomes. There is a process called meiosis that is the main reason of why, starting from a normal cell, you end up with a normal eggs. And this may also happen in men. In men, this problem is not so age-related as in women, okay? But uh, in fact, in Spain, you can be a sperm donor until you're 50. But given that your husband is 55, uh, 59, sometimes the percentage of uh, sperm that carry genetic abnormalities could be higher also because of the age. And this may mean that despite having good eggs, the sperm is the one who is causing the genetically problem, and this could be behind the miscarriage, the, the fact that you have uh, this embryo, just one embryo. So in this case, my recommendation would be if, we, if you have not had the karyotypes, first do the karyotypes, and then there is a, tel, a test called fish, fish, okay, like the animal, that basically checks the percentage of uh, sperm that carry genetic issues because this may also affect the quality of the embryo. And then if the fish is normal, probably you may have to change a protocol or, uh, or well, that's something that we have to discuss in depth. But the first thing that I would recommend you is checking the genetics of the sperm because it's true that the eggs are really, really important and probably the most important part of this equation, but the sperm also plays a role. And sometimes patients, especially when they have good spermiograms, it's like they are fertile just because they have a normal spermiogram, and it is not like that sometimes. 
All right. Thank you so much for your question as well as your recommendation. Actually, there is a follow-up question from the very same patient, so let me go to it straight away. Uh, okay, Fish, I heard about this. We did the karyotype, both of us, no mutations, but no genetic of the sperm was done. So no Fish test. Exactly. The, the problem with the fish is that sometimes it's quite difficult to, to have it done in a place with a, with a reliable test, you know. Uh, we, we are quite used to do it because we are quite fond of studying um, men when, when things don't go and we tend not to blame women every time we have a negative or every time we have uh, embryos that uh, do not uh, make us happy. Uh, so, well, that's something that you would have to, to consider. In some cases, and also because of the age and because of the varicose cell, there could be a DNA fragmentation that may also impair the quality of, of uh, yeah, but the, exactly, yeah, yeah, but this does not affect, we are not talking about DNA fragmentation, which is something that you can change in three months because you are using your sperm. Uh, the fish basically checks if there is anything abnormal in the generation process of the sperm. And if it is, it is something that it will be always like that. It could be sometimes uh, you can have a higher uh, percentage or a lower, but it's going to be, uh, it's going to increase the risk of having genetic issues in them. There's another one? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, it could ha it could happen. I mean, probably uh, uh, if if the fish is abnormal, it's going to be really tough because that means uh, w there is no way of choosing an sperm uh, with the right genetics. If you want to know if that sperm is genetically normal, you have to destroy it so you can no longer use it to inseminate an egg. So you may have an sperm that is abnormal, but the other one besides can be normal. So it's a bit of a of a of luck when we choose the sperm. Um, but we know that when the fish is abnormal, there's going to be a higher percentage of embryos that are going to be genetically normal. So you would only be able to consider PGS to identify these embryos, but also taking into account the number of embryos that you have. I don't know if the root of uh, IBF PGS would be really good one, a really good one for you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for uh, for that uh, advice. Let me go to the very next question for you right here. Is it true that sperm quality and motility can be improved taking antioxidants uh, during three months while sperm is regenerating? But that's something that is related, as I've said before, to DNA fragmentation. The DNA fragmentation means that the amount of the DNA of the sperm in terms of chromosomes is normal, but is fragmented. So that this is something that the OSET has to deal with that and has to repair that. And if you are over 40 and the quality of the eggs is not good, the impact of the DNA fragmentation on the embryo quality is going to be much more important than if you uh, have an egg donation or you are 25. Then one of the things that have been suggested to, to do uh, is to increase or to take antioxidants during three months to renew all the sperm. But again, in this particular group of patients, three months can make a huge difference depending on the age. So there are other ways of dealing with the DNA fragmentation that in my opinion are much, much more useful in patients over 40, like MC, which is a technique that allows us to identify which sperm has a higher or a lower degree of DNA fragmentation. And then by doing that, you don't need to invest three months to get a result that sometimes can be better, but sometimes can be a waste of time because you are not gonna get any improvement and you are going to lose three months or even more trying to improve the sperm when there are other ways of doing it much faster. Perfect. Thank you again so much for uh, that advice and explanation. And now let me go to the next question for you. I am 44, AMH 2.3, one failed IUI, one cancelled IVF cycle due to early evaluation, second cycle, two eggs uh, collection, at collection, both fertilized by donor, but didn't survive 24 hours. Mm. Would you recommend trying mm. another cycle using own eggs? Okay. Um, uh, well, the, the, there is one thing that is really important regarding uh, regarding the IMH is that there are two different units. It can be 
uh, assessed in picomoles per liter, or it can be assessed in nanograms per milliliter. And the values are completely different. I mean, 2.3, I assume that given your response, we are talking about picomoles per liter, which is a quite low AMH. Uh, because if there were nanograms per milliliter, that would be a, a lovely AMH, okay? So sometimes it's difficult to, to explain things. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, I mean, in your case, there is one important thing to take, in, to take into account. Th this is a general question, eh? okay? But it's, 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 most of the time it's true. The DNA of the sperm is activated on day three, okay? So that means that the embryo, the first three days lives from what it gets from the egg. And when there are problems in, in the sperm, sometimes they appear at when, when, uh, when the fertilization takes place and when the embryo is on day three, day four, or day five. So most of the time, when the embryos have problems in the first days and they don't have the quality from the very beginning, this basically means that there is a problem with the egg. When we have an embryo that is really good, and suddenly on day three, four, five, it gets worse. Sometimes it could be due to the sperm because on day three is when the sperm DNA is activated. As I see in your case, they both get, they get fertilized, but they didn't survive, survive 24 hours. So it looks very much that you have a problem with the quality of the eggs. So in your case, given your age, given your ovarian reserve, given the results that we have seen in the larger studies, and the fact that you have already had a treatment, if you remember that graphic that patients of your age really has, have a flat line that does not improve, does not increase the pregnancies, regardless of how many attempts, my recommendation would be in your case, egg donation. And again, thank you so much for your uh, question and your uh, excellent uh, detailed answer as well. Uh, thank you um, so much. Okay, now let me go to the next question. It's 1.5 AMH or low iron for a 30-year-old. And how many follicles are expected to be retrieved with this AMH? Would you recommend an IVF with only cells in this case? Um, I need to know if we are talking about picomoles or nanograms. Picomoles is a very low MH. Nanograms is a quite good um, yes, level of MH. Uh, we have follow up nanograms. Nanograms. Uh, she has already answered. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, that, that, that's that's a that's a, a good ovarian reserve. I would say that with that, I mean, for someone thirty now, you could expect to produce probably eight to ten x. Okay. Perfect. Thank you so much. So, uh, so if if if, you, if there is nothing else with eight to ten eggs, yes, I would consider IBF with your own cells. Fantastic. Another thing is quality, eh? as I've said before. But at least in terms of the amount of eggs, no issues. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, actually, we have two questions, very similar ones uh, about Elonva. Um, so hmm. have a look at it. Is manufactured where? Never heard of this before. This is a new drug. Is this the equivalent of menopause? It is not. It is not new. I mean, it's a drug that we have been using for probably seven years now, five, six, six seven years. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Elomba is is a drug that at the very beginning, uh, I think that the problem was the laboratory because they didn't advertise it very well. Elomba is a very very strong drug, and and basically the laboratory was focused too much on the risk of having a hyperstimulation syndrome because of the number of follicles that you can produce, and people and doctors were really very afraid of using it. Uh, of course, in cases in, in in this group of patients that are over forty, the risk of hyperstimulation is negligible because usually we deal with very low ovarian reserves or low ovarian reserve. So the risk of getting 40 or 30 eggs would be absolutely, probably if you are 42 and you produce 30 eggs, you may not need IVF at all, you know. So it's a quite comfortable, as I've said, it's a drug that now I use in probably 90% of my first IVF, okay. It has, it's different from the menopause, it's FSH, FSH, like the Gonalev, like Puregon, but it has been modified in a way that it keeps stimulating the follicles for seven days. It's called corifolitropine alpha, okay? So it's not menopure, it's not HMG, like the menopure, it's just FSH. 
Thank you. And as I mentioned, there is another question about this. So what would you implement with <laughs> after the seven days up until trigger at menopause? <laughs> Yeah, in fact, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I mean, the, 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 the standard protocol with the Alomba is that you have, you start, I mean, in a, in a normal patient, and not using androgens, is that uh, patients contact us on day one of her cycle, she takes the Alomba on day three, then uh, on day seven, eight, and nine of the cycle, the patient starts the antagonist to block the ovulation, and the patient has the first scan on day 10 of the cycle. There is no need to do a scan before because you are on a fixed protocol. So we are not going to be able to change anything. So this also it uh, makes uh, the treatment quite comfortable for the patient because you don't have to go to the gynecologist to have a scan every two days. And then on day 10, like 20% 20, 20 of the patients are ready for egg collection. So that means that they have enough follicles of the right size and we can trigger ovulation. So they are going to have one scan, four injections, and they are ready. And the remaining 80% may need between one and two and three more days of a stimulation until we get that amount of follicles of the right size. And in this case, I usually prefer to work with AMH because also in this phase of the cycle, the LH levels in the natural cycle are higher. So to me, it's much more physiological to add menopause. Uh, for example, I work a lot with Mediofert, which is a different, is a -M -A -M HMG, but obtained from the placenta. So it's a slightly more, por more powerful. And, and I work with doses of 150 because the only thing I, at that stage, I cannot modify the number of follicles. I just want them to grow until they, reach, until they reach the right size. So I'm not focused on using a lot of doses because if the patient has not responded with the lumbar, it's very unlikely going to respond if I continue with the stimulation. If I work with menopause, sometimes because it is not as as as, as uh, strong as the Mediofert, I work with two hundred twenty-five. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for that advice as well. Again, and uh, we have another question coming up here. So, what does a normal antral follicle reserve look like? How many antral follicles should be there? The more, the better. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, as I've said, it, it depends on, on, on the age. Um, one of the things that I have to say is that when I compare AMH and antral follicle count, sometimes there are differences. So uh, I have a very low AMH and I do a scan and the patient has seven follicles. Okay. And this is, you no, know, that you have to decide because there is a really big difference between what you get from the scan and what you get from the image. In general, my, op my opinion is that AMH is much more relevant than antral follicle count. And if you have a low AMH and a good number of follicles, it is very likely that if you go through an IVF, these small follicles are not going to grow. There was an, an study carried out many years ago that they were measuring the levels of AMH inside of the follicle. And they noticed that there were follicles in which the AMH were absolutely high and follicles that were very, very low. So basically, they correlate the idea of this hike of low intrafollicular levels of AMH with the possibility that that follicle was of good quality or not and that that follicle could grow or not. Okay. So when I have a really uh, very different results from the counter folk under follicle count and the EMH. I, I rely more I rely more rely more on the on the on the EMH. In terms of antral follicle, a, a normal one it would be between eight and ten follicles. That would I would consider a normal antral follicle count. Perfect. Thank you so much. And actually, there is a follow-up question. Uh, so if you could look at it right here, can the antral follicle result be determined during a normal uh, checkup? Well, but it has to be. The, the, the only limitation that has the, uh, the antral follicle count is that it should be done in the first three, four days of the cycle. Mm -hmm. Okay. In, other, in any other moment of the cycle, it could be uh, different. The AMH can be checked in any moment of the cycle. Okay, uh, unless you are undergoing some kind of um, some treatments, but in general, even if you are if you are on a contraceptive pill, 
uh, the AMH can be checked. It tend to be slightly lower if you have been for a long period of time, but since the person, the people who, who check uh, the IMH is trying to conceive, it's very, very strange that they are on long treatments of, uh, of anti uh, contraceptive pills. All right, perfect. Thank you again for the question as well as your help with it. And uh, now let me go to the next question. I have AMI 0 0.739 and follicles count 6. What would be the chance to be pregnant with the first time, for the first time IVF? You've forgotten the most important data, your age. Yes, <laughs> because if you could add if, that if, if, if you are if you 40. 40, yes. Well, uh, if there's if everything else is normal, okay, the chances of having a baby could be between a fifteen and twenty percent. But that depends also on other clinical factors, you know. For example, uh, the duration of the infertility. It is not the same if you've been trying to conceive for five years and for two. Uh, if there is any male factor or not. I mean, if you have had miscarriages, if you got pregnant or not. I mean, also depending on, on, on the uterus, if there are fibroids or not, these are kind of things that can modify the pregnancy rate. But assuming that everything else is normal, assuming that you not have a long-standing unexplained infertility with this count, you can produce, I mean, there is a very good correlation with 0 0.7 nanograms, you, could, you should expect to get six, six, seven. So the chances of having one, one, embryo or two good embryos are good and the chances should be around that i mean talking about life birth should be around uh, that 15 20 percent all right thank you so much again for uh, your uh, advice perfect uh, now let me go ahead with the very next question how do you know that a woman has got a high level of andro androgens uh, how hmm. does this manifest no, um, the, the, the androgens that I, I mentioned are not androgens that you can assess because I'm talking about intraovarian androgens. So that's something that if you want to know that, you have to go through a very selective function to obtain blood from inside of the ovaries or the follicles. So it's not something that you can do in a clinical easy way it's basically is done when you are trying to do some research and and it has been confirmed that when you aspirate small follicles and you check the levels of androgens inside of these follicles uh, younger patients tend to have higher follicles so that's something that uh, you can do when you don't have a good ovarian reserve because one of the reasons that may a big cause in this ovarian reserve is that the ovary that the ovaries may have low uh, levels of androgens. So if you supply these androgens, uh, you have only to supply them for five days because if you do a lot of if you use a lot of a lot of androgens, this may cause a negative effect. Okay, so having high levels of androgens are not is not uh, is neither good. So it's only for five days at the very beginning. And these kind of tests are, has, are, have only been done for research purposes. Fantastic. Again, thanks so much. Uh, next question right here. Uh, what is important to know? When do the cells divide? You mean which day from one to five, four to the fifth one? I mean, the, the embryos keep dividing during, during those five days. You know, um, One thing that is really important with regards to the time lapse is that the cell division pattern may change from laboratory to laboratory. So sometimes it's very difficult to compare. I cannot go to another laboratory and import and import their protocols because probably they are not going to be good for me because my lab is going to have a different conditions. So one thing that is really important with regards, with regards to the time lapse is that you have to develop your patterns. You have to identify when the embryo divides and when it, this is going to mean a good or a better prognosis, okay? So the, 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 the timing of when the embryo goes from one to two cells to two, to, from two to four cells is different from laboratory. Uh, sometimes you can, it is not only about timing, but also about how it is dividing. Sometimes you see an embryo that from one cell goes to three. And this is an abnormal cell division that, uh, 
uh, and worsens the, the prognosis. So we gather a lot of information during the time lab, during the culture used in time labs. And this uh, basically um, means that we have to, first, we have, we have had to invest time to develop the, 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 the normal patterns in our laboratory. Thank you so much again. And actually, there's a question about uh, time lapse uh, here. So, mm -hmm. hello. do all clinics have time lapse? If not, what is the alternative used by these clinics? Does it make a difference in the sense that it allows embryos to develop up to the fifth day? Uh, well, time lapse is uh, becoming more and more uh, used, and and basically because. Um, I would say that first because, it, and this is my personal opinion, they are really useful. I mean, we didn't we didn't uh, start working with time labs when they were released. Okay, uh, we we needed up to four years to add it to our our standard procedure because we first wanted to confirm that the results were going to be better. Okay, because obviously the company that sells the time labs is going to tell you that it's gorgeous, you know, like other company but we always want to confirm that the results that they claim that to have are really those that we have in our laboratory so we invested four years working with them until we confirmed that the results were when and then we added them to our standard uh, workflow in the lab um, um, if if the clinic that you are going to does not have them well this is going to be a problem that depends on how many embryos that you have depending on uh, in my opinion, is crucial because uh, when you are talking with uh, about a group that does not produce a lot of embryos, let's say that you are 27, you have a problem with your tubes and you are doing an IVF with a really lovely ovarian reserve and you produce 11 or 18 eggs and you have 10 embryos. If you end up with 8 or 12 embryos, okay, this is not going to make a really big difference in terms of results. But if you only have four or five eggs and you have one embryo or two embryos or three embryos, it's going to be a really big difference in terms of uh, cumulative, li cumulative uh, live birth. So anything that we can do in order to take care of these embryos, anything that can in slightly increase the number of embryos that you have is going to boost your chances of success. Maybe not in the first attempt, but you are going to have more options without having to go through another round of IVF. So I think that if it's possible, choose a clinic who, which has the, the time lapse incubators. Thank you so much again for your question uh, and, of course, for helping out. Uh, here's a short question right here. How much better is NGS than PGS? Well, um, in fact, PGS is the procedure. It stands for pre-implantational genetic screening, and it has different techniques. It can be done through PCR, NGS, and microarrays um, and karyomapping, okay? There are different techniques that can be used to do the PGS. NGS is one of the techniques that help us identify which embryos are normal or not. And in my opinion, is currently the best treatment, the best technique to do a PGS. So when we do a PGS, we always use NGS. NGS stands for Next Generation Sequency which is a technique to identify which embryos are normal or not. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you so much for explaining this one to us as well. And uh, here's another question. How much time until the next simulation after a still miscarriage? If, um, okay, so that depends on how complicated the pregnancy was uh, and also depending on when the miscarriage uh, takes place. If it's something like a biochemical miscarriage, those cases in which you have a positive and a few days later you start bleeding and you confirm that the initial beta positive week five. If, if the initial beta uh, has turned out uh, negative, you only need to wait until your next period and you can try uh, again. 
Okay, so that's something that we call exactly so. No have been detained. If you've had a miscarriage and you've had a natural complete miscarriage, we usually recommend waiting for the second period after the miscarriage. So after you miscarriage, either naturally or through a DNC, you are going to have a first a first uh, period 30 to 40 days after with the next one aspiration. So you had a DNC with the next one, with the second period, you can start, you can start. There is no need to, to wait for more, for more time. Thank you again for uh, your answer. And now let me go to the next question. This one, uh, okay, here. I am 40 and my husband is 38. We had four miscarriages within the last three years, two tested with genetic problems. What would you recommend? The last miscarriage was eight weeks ago. When would you recommend to start again? Uh, with regards to the uh, recurrent pregnancy laws, um, I have to say that the most important reason is the genetic problems. If these genetic problems are related to your age and the quality of the eggs or to something else, that's something that you would have to test. My first recommendation would be doing karyotypes to both of them to see if you are an unknown healthy carrier of any abnormality, chromosomal abnormality that may explain these miscarriages. And if it, and if, it, if the karyotypes are normal, very likely, because the abnormal karyotypes are quite strange, uh, then my recommendation would be IBF plus PGS. In a patient who gets pregnant naturally, as I've said, there is nothing that we can do to increase the quality of the eggs. So that's something. And the, the more miscarriages you have, the more likely that the next pregnancy ends up in a new miscarriage. So the chances of a miscarriage in a third or four are higher and higher and keep and keep increasing. So if uh, my recommendation in your case would be probably IBF, PGS, because you don't want an embryo, you want a genetically normal embryo. So in your case, it does not make sense to try IBF and transfer without carrying a genetic testing on the embryos, because that's something that you already uh, you have already done and you can still do at home. If you just want to go through IBF, it would be to discard those genetically abnormal embryos. Right. And when, uh, with regards to, to start, as I've said, I mean, uh, once you have had your second period, you can consider a new a first IBF and, and try. Uh, you, can you keep trying and trying naturally? You can, but if you are having miscarriages, every miscarriage is going to mean quite a few months between you get pregnant, you miscarriage, you have the DNC, you wait, and time starts uh, being crucial for you. So probably I, I would suggest if the carrier is abnormal to consider IBF as soon as possible. And thank you again for uh, that advice, of course. And now we have a bit of a longer question right here. So let's take mm -hmm. a look. I am 40, partner 42. My eggs and his sperm don't fertilize. We have had better success with ICSI. I got eight eggs for the first ICSI and five blastocysts. Two chemical pregnancies resulted in two negative. Next cycle, six eggs and three embryos miscarriage at six, uh, five weeks with twins. We will go again, but I'm wondering, A, is the lack of fertilization through IVF a bad sign of normality or of cells second should i be getting more eggs i am in my my am made sorry 14.2 that's big um okay so um i i would like to know the, the the protocols that you've been on so far you know but it looks like there is something something rock inside of the embryos you know the fact that you, another thing is that these abnormalities come from the sperm or come from the from the egg and most of the time they tend to come they tend to come from from the from the eggs the, the main problem that that we have is that as i've said we don't have any way of checking the quality of the eggs other than going through an ibm so one of the things that we do in cases like yours is that we try to confirm that there is no genetic issue on the male side basically doing a fish like i've explained before because it's going to confirm that the percentage of abnormal sperm is normal okay and once we are sure that there's nothing wrong on the main side we can try to work with an ibf and do a genetic testing on the embryos okay because if we know that the male is health 
anything that we can find in the embryos is very likely going to be due to the quality of the eggs. So it's going to be an indirect way of knowing the real quality of those eggs. And the, um, with that AMH, probably you may be able to produce yeah, probably more like 10 eggs or something like that. So this is why probably in your case, considering Lomba, it would be a good option if you have not used it yet, because it could increase the number of eggs. And in cases in which the number of embryos is not that high, in cases in which, which is very common, that uh, I have to say, in patients uh, over 40, and we end up with two, three embryos, sometimes patients are reluctant to invest money on a PGS. One of the things that can be done is an embryo banking, which means that we can do an IVF. And if we have two blastoses or three, we can do the biopsy and freeze them. But we don't do the PGS yet. We go through another round of IVF and we get two or three more embryos. And then once we have five, six, or as many embryos as the couple or the patient wants to have, we can go through one, two, or three rounds of IBF until we get a good number of blastocysts, and then we carry out a single PGS in all the embryos that we have got from the different cycles. And by doing that, we can increase the chances of finding a normal embryo. Of course, this costs money, and you have to balance very well if it's worth or not doing that. But this could be a good option for those patients who want to keep working with their cells and they don't produce too many embryos. Uh, with regards to the lack of fertilization, uh, I have to say that we never try conventional IVF. In our clinic, 100% of the cycles are done with ICSI because sometimes it could be just an isolated issue, nothing relevant, and you're losing a cycle that can be perfectly treated if you do ICSI. So uh, yes, sometimes a lack of fertilization could be a problem, but if you do ICSI and you get embryos, um, it's not a really clinic. It could be a problem in the natural fertility because that's something that could explain why you have why you have not got pregnant because um, uh, because of this low fertilization or lack of fertilization. But once you do ICSI, you are solving the problem. Fantastic. Thank you again so much for that. And here's a bit of a shorter question. So let's uh, let me show you. Is AMH 16 PMO a lower good for 40 year old? 43. 16 picomoles. Yes. Uh, six, uh, six is, uh, yeah, it's quite, it's low. It's low because it's going to be, just let me, I, I'm going to. Mm, Okay, 60 epimoles, you have to divide it by seven, is one point, no, no, it's not that bad. Sometimes it's difficult for me to work out and to change from one system. I was trying to, to look for a tool, uh, but 16 picomoles is seven, yeah, it's 1.8, which is not, not, not bad, nanograms for someone of 43. Uh, yes, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, and now let me show you the next one. What about inhibin B as an mm -hmm. indicator of ovarian reserve? It's an old tool. It's, uh, we we no, lo no okay. longer use it. The inhibin B was related when it was very low uh, to, uh, it, it was related to the acceleration of the cycles that take place when someone is going to get, uh, to start becoming menopausal. But so far is uh, it is used in men because it's related to uh, low spermatogenesis, but in, in women, so far, there is not very many people because uh, it is not as, w once we have started having the AMH, these tools uh, do, not add, do not add any really useful information. Thank you again so much for explaining that. And now let me go to the next question. Can you please name again the technique used in case of severe um, fragmentation in order to still be able to under identify a normal sperm without DNA fragmentation? You mentioned mm -hmm. the correlation with the fish testing of sperm. Uh, thank you. No, the, 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 the technique is called IMSI. I-M-S-I. It stands for high magnification sperm injection. 
The difference uh, between the IMSI and the ICSI is that when we do ICSI, we choose the sperm at 400 magnification. When we do IMSI, we choose it at 8,000. So we see a lot of more, a lot of things inside. And one of the things that we can see is that the sperm that has a high degree of DNA fragmentation have shown some small vacuoles and vesicles inside of the head the sperm that cannot be seen when you choose them at for exactly MC exactly okay Perfect. so when we when we choose the sperm at 8000 we can see those vacuoles those vesicles inside and we discard the sperm and we try to work okay with only those that have no vesicles no vacuoles or have the smallest one or the fewest one and by doing that we are very effectively reducing the impact of abnormal DNA fragmentation. Unfortunately, IMSI does not help to identify which sperms are genetically normal. No way. It just can be only used when there is a severe ceratothospermia, I mean, with the abnormal forms in the self spermiogram are very high, or when there is a high DNA fragmentation rate. Perfect. Thank you so much once again for explaining this. And now we have a bit of a longer question again, so let's have a look. Mm -hmm. Made for ICSI, less than one year between 42 and early 43, seven, eight oocytes recovered each time. Most of them deteriorated on the third, fourth day. Even if some of them arrived mm -hmm. at blastocyst, only one embryo arrived at PGS, three chromosome anomalies. As a result, mm -hmm. based on what you said, could be due to my husband's DNA abnormalities. Based on fish, he's got a little higher risk over the average on 13th chromosome. Mm, this is <laughs> those cases that uh, are really complicated because we have a mixed factor. And, and sometimes it's very difficult to decide what do we have to change. Um, according to the result of your PGS, uh, you had the three chromosome abnormalities. Uh, I, I, uh, do, my, man, I understand that you mean that there were three chromosomes with abnormalities, not that you had three copies of one chromosome, okay? Uh, this is kind of kind of complex, complex abnormality. Um, what I can tell you in this case is that when we have a combination, I mean, you, you have different things that um, really um, makes the prognosis poor. Uh, first, the number of attempts. You've tried four times, I mean, and on four times you have not uh, managed to get a good embryo uh, in all these attempts, no? Because if you have had four Xs and seven, eight oocytes, it means that you have produced like 30 eggs so far, you know? Um, age is really relevant, uh, but also you have an abnormal fish. So the, determine which is the, the, the most important problem is very difficult. The only thing that I can tell you is that I wouldn't recommend keep doing or keep working with uh, your ex and uh, your husband's sperm. You, you must change something. Uh, in this scenario, wow. Um, probably just because I feel that the eggs are still much more important than the sperm. In because of all the other things that they offer to the embryo, mitochondria, energy, probably my recommendation would be considering egg donation, using your husband's sperm if you want, but still doing PGS because based on the fish of your husband, uh, the risk of having genetic issues in the embryos, regardless of using egg donor, an egg donor are still high. Obviously, the best option for you would be a double donation or an embryo donation because that would be the way. But if you have to choose between IVF with your eggs and a an sperm donor or egg donation and using your husband's sperm, probably I would, I would recommend egg donation using your husband's sperm and adding PGS to uh, check which embryos are genetically normal. Fantastic. Thank you again so much for that. And now we have another question. What is your experience with using costal baguette, I believe, I'm not sure, sorry, by mate proof spermiogram? 
Thank you. Um, first time I hear this name. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so my experience is below zero. I'm I'm really sorry. Okay. If you can, tell, I don't know if this is a brand, and probably if mm -hmm. you just tell if me which are the compounds contained into exactly. that process, I would be able to help you. Yes, exactly. So if you could just follow up on that, we but will definitely get back. In general, in general, what I can tell you, uh, not 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 about this specific product, but one of the main problems that we have with vitamins, with antioxidants, are that they that they improve the quality of the spermiogram, but they don't improve the life birth. Uh, and this is so far the, what, the, what the studies have shown. So um, again, um, having a better sperm, uh, it would make sense only if this would allow us to change the technique. I mean, if you have uh, an, an sperm that is bad, but not that bad, and you are considering IVF, and you use something that can improve it enough to consider IUI, then it makes sense. But once you are doing IVF, if you have 1 million or 3 million, if you have a 10% motility or a 20% motility, this is not going to change the outcome. This is not going to change. So to me, it's a waste of time. And again, time is crucial when you are over 40. So we have to be very careful about what we recommend to our patients and how much time do they need to notice the benefits because what we, we can get from that could be lost in terms of egg quality. Thank you again so much uh, for that. All right, so we have the next question. If you are in a perimenopause and plan to use donor sperm and oocytes, how is the preparation done to prepare the embryo transfer when periods stay away for a couple of months and you have no much time remaining, age 49? Well, uh, in fact, you don't need you don't even need to have your period to undergo an egg donation because the egg donations are always done using an hormone replacement therapy. So basically, in our clinic, when we do an egg donation, a double donation, an embryo donation, what we when we do an egg donation, what we do is that we synchronize the cycle of the donor and the, and the cycle of the recipient, and this is done by putting the recipient on a contraceptive pill. If you have periods, you start the contraceptive pill on day one of any of your cycles. If you have very irregular periods, sometimes what we recommend is that you have a scan. And if the scan confirms that the ovaries are downregulated, they are not working, then you can start straight away the pill, even if you don't have a period. And by doing that, then uh, uh, we take control of your cycle. And then we can that we can use a donor that is also going to be on the pill, and we make you and your donor stop the pills on the same day, having your periods. Because if you have a if you have been taking a pill, you are going to bleed, and then start with the hormones that are going to prepare the endometrium, and you are we are going to synchronize this uh, cycle with the cycle of the donor in a way that once we do the collection of the donor, five days later, you are going to be ready for the embryo transfer. But it is not really difficult. Thank you again so much for that. And we have a few questions left, so we will be slowly finishing. But if you have any other questions, just go ahead and type them in so uh, Dr. Raul can answer. And now, again, let me uh, show you. Uh, perhaps you have some comments to this. My feeling is that the clinic reduced my chance of obtaining many embryos after fertilization of six. I only got two embryos with AMH 1.5. Any comments on that? Well, uh, in egg donation, only 60% of the embryos that we have become blastocysts. Okay. So one of the things that you have to be aware when you take the embryos to day five is that you're going to lose a lot of embryos on the way even if even even uh, if you do uh, the, the the egg donation okay so if you have six and you end up with two embryos in someone who is around 40 it is not a bad result of course i don't know which lab you were which was your clinic i don't know the conditions of the lab so um and also in your case there is a there is a male factor that may also reduce your chances you know so the AMH is important only in terms of oocytes. But once you are go beyond that point, once you are talking about embryos, the sperm 
comes also into, into play. And of course, the laboratory conditions, the, the procedures may also sometimes play a role and may, and may change the, 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 the outcome. But AMH is not directly related with the amount of embryos when there is another factors in between, like a male factor. That is great advice as well. Thank you so much. Um, okay, there's another question about acupuncture. So would you recommend it? Do you have positive <clears throat> patients that underwent acupuncture in your clinic? We offer acupuncture in our clinic, but with regards to these old kind of things, and um, um, it is important to, to know how to use them. You know, the, the main problem that we have with these kind of techniques is that sometimes patients are offer things that are impossible, okay? Like they are going to have more eggs, they are going to have better eggs, and they invest a lot of time in using a technique that nowadays there are a lot of studies that confirm that does not have an impact in the quality or amount of eggs. In some cases in which the endometrium is not good, it may help improve the blood flow. Uh, but the, the, the effectiveness of the acupuncture in terms of improving the live birth is very, very poor. Another thing is how it's going to help is that how acupuncture is going to help you to cope with the whole history of your IVF. And we offer it right before the embryo transfer and right after the embryo transfer because it helps the patients to stay relaxed, to stay calm, and then it makes the transfer easier. And in this sense, there is a correlation. The more difficult the transfer is, the poorer the results are. So if we can do a safe, easy, and fast embryo transfer, the results are going to be better. And again, thank you so much for this. Uh, here's the next question. Problem is that for NGS, I would need to fly abroad twice, as I believe it takes a month. But now considering I might have difficulties going abroad at all, I was thinking that it might be easier to skip NGS and spend a week abroad, but not sure how much that would worsen the chances. Yeah, it's true. I mean, when we, when we treat patients, when we do IBF, and we do, and in patients that want to do PGS, they basically have to fly twice to Barcelona. Uh, we try to do the, the, the whole process in their countries of origin. So basically, we can send you the prescriptions, the protocol, you contact us on day one, you have your scans with your doctors, you send us the reports, based on the reports, we decide how to proceed. And only once we trigger the ovulation is when we ask patients to fly to Barcelona. They usually fly the day before of the egg collection. We do the egg collection. And the next day, if we are going to do PGS, yes, or yes, if the next day of the egg collection, they fly back home. Okay, then we keep them posted about how the embryos are doing on the day for the fertilization, day three, and on day five, six, because the day five, six is when we are going to do the biopsy. And then we need two weeks to get the results of, of, the, of, the, of the genetics. And then once we know if there is any um, normal embryo, then we get in touch with the patient, we prepare the patient for the transfer with a normal replacement treatment, with estrogens, a scan in their country, and then they just fly for the embryo transfer. They fly the day before the embryo transfer, we do the embryo transfer, and they fly back the next day, okay? And this is the standard way of proceeding with a PGS. So, but if you need it, you would have to find a way of, of doing that because mm -hmm. transferring embryos without being tested, if you have a problem or negative or previous, is not going to change anything compared to what you've done before. All right. Thank you so much, Megan for that advice. Uh, all right, there's another one here. Uh, I tend to get depressed from the hormones. What can I do to improve the impact of the treatment on my mental well-being? Had two IVF and three KET. Uh, I am 40 and there's additional information. I got pregnant once during the cycle, but it was a wow. cervical ectopic pregnancy. Wow, that's really, really um, very, very unlikely because cervical ectopic pregnancies, I think I've seen only once in my life. So that really, 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 very strange situation. Uh, well, we will have to see if this is just because of the hormones or because of the process you are through. Because sometimes there is a quite mixed 
um, it's quite difficult. But one of the things that we recommend, of course, is uh, um, you have to be very open about what you're doing. One of the main problems of IBF or assisted reproduction techniques in general is that patients tend to leave it in a very close way, you know, not sharing their feelings. And sometimes this even happens inside of the couple. Uh, like if you are afraid that someone is going to blame you or you're going to blame your husband or, you know. So um, um, we, we always recommend and we, and we have a psychologist working in our clinic because it's uh, very important that patients understand how to cope with the negatives, with the results, with the uncertainty of what is going to happen. If you, it's very stressful, you know, a lot of uh, times patients ask me about the stress and I say that the stress is basically ignorant to the treatments. It belongs, it's inside. I mean, someone who goes through a stimulation without knowing how it is going to respond, then the quality of the eggs, then the quality of the embryos. If you want to have a PGS, then if they are going to be genetically. And once you transfer the embryo, you have no guarantee about the outcome. So I can't imagine how really, how hard Hard, how how difficult in terms of emotions this this process can be for someone so look for psychological support try to be open and and try to to inform probably not everyone because then if you inform everyone then probably you're going to get the pressure of the people uh, giving their opinions and telling you what to do and what to not to do i've read why do I, you know but at, at least to a good number of people that are that you think that are going to support you it's also very important to have a very good communication and to play the role of the male and the female in a couple as a as a whole and uh, and if it's necessary of course in this case i really believe that acupuncture the chinese medicine may help to have a better um, emotions and 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 to reduce the stress that is is these treatments are going to to cause yes thank you so much uh you already have uh, provided some advice of course on on that how to cope with uh, with the uh stress etc but also as we, i would like you to see that uh, there's another person here uh the similar situation yeah, i got a slight depression due to the hormones of yeah. the st stimulation especially uh, after the mm -hmm. clinical pregnancy was confirmed age 30 39 anything you could add well basically in my opinion um patients tend to blame the hormones too often and and the hormones very seldom cause depression I think that is much bit more much more complicated, and usually uh, involves more things than not just the treatment that you've been through. Uh, because if the if the drugs would care, would cause depression, we would have a lot of egg donors with depression. If the if the problem are the hormones, and believe me when I say that my egg donors don't get depressed. So it is not the treatment itself. It's the environment, the whole thing that makes you go through this process that is causing the depression. And thank you again so much for that. As I mentioned, there are like only a few questions left uh, and we will be finishing. Uh, so um, let me go to this one. What's the, what do you think about inositol for ovarian hmm. Well, there is a lot of ongoing research on, on inositol, okay? But it basically has been suggested for cases of polycystic ovaries in which the amount of mature eggs sometimes is quite low. So polycystic ovaries, they are people who tend to have a very good ovarian reserve. In fact, the main problem they have is that it's very easy for them to go into hyperstimulation syndrome because of the number of follicles that they produce. But then when you pick up the eggs, you get a lot of immature eggs regardless of when you pick them up, regardless of the size of the follicles. And inositol has been claimed to improve the percentage of mature eggs. And just because of that, in some cases, it has been suggested and it has been tested in patients trying to improve the quality of the eggs. But so far, the information that we have in this particular field is very low, very low quality information. And as I've, so far, I've, I'm not aware of any study that has confirmed that it could improve the quality of the eggs or even the amount of follicles. 
And again, thank you. And now let go, let's go to the next question. Can the pathology, the biopsy of the embryo of all miscarriage detect whether the, the endometrium was the issue of the miscarriage or not, since also parts of the endometrium are also analyzed at the uh, biopsy? It depends because if you check the endometrium, sometimes it can give you information about if there is any kind of infection or something that may have caused the miscarriage. Uh, but not the endometrium as a cause. I mean, the endometrium can reflect a current infection that may be due to other factors that can have caused the miscarriage. That, that if the endometrium causes the miscarriage, is you is usually because there is a kind of a abnormal implantation, and then this is something that can allow the embryo implant. But then later on pregnancy, there are, there are restrictions in the in the blood flow between the endometrium and the and the and the and the embryo, and this may make may cause the miscarriage. But this is something that is very difficult to identify if it's possible at all. I think it is not uh, with, the, with the study of the, of the stuff that you get from a DNC. It's basically something that you can use to check if, uh, if there is kind of a genetic abnormality or not, or if there has been any infection. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, now there's another question here. Um, sperm taken directly from testicle has less DNA fragmentation. Is it true? Um, according to my experience, no. Uh, I've, uh, we, we did a lot of research on this issue, and now it's going back, uh, it's coming back, and there are some people. But, you know, the main problem with the testicle aspiration or testicle biopsy is that you may get lower fragmentation because the DNA fragmentation takes place in the epididymis, which is the, the channel that uh, is uh, right after the testicles, okay? So the idea is that if you avoid the passage of the sperm through this channel where it gets damaged, the, uh, the sperm is gonna be uh, of better quality, but the problem is that when you use uh, this, um, sperm from the testicle, you may have a higher risk of having genetic issues in that sperm. So uh, the thing is that the benefits of having a better a better DNA fragmentation, theoretically, because there are other DNA fragmentations that are primary and they take place inside of the testicle, it could be balanced, uh, ba uh, balanced by the fact that the sperm may have, is more likely to have genetic problems. So um, in cases of DNA fragmentation, if you compare IMSI, which is something that is not going to change your protocol at all, with the fact of doing a testicular biopsy to the male that could be unnecessary, it's much more expensive, much more complicated, and in our opinion, not necessary, if you have IMSI. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you so much again. Uh, there are two questions left, and after that, of course, we will be finishing. So let's get to it. Uh, here's the question. You spoke about scan for my question of using egg donation. Do you mean yeah. ultrasound? It has been done, and there is almost nothing. AMH is 0 0.03. Last ovulation was in January. Does vitamins influence the cycle? Period stop when I started using gravitamin. All B vitamins with folic acid. Yeah increases and vitamins A, C, D, A, and E? No, no. I mean, probably you are, you are menopausal because uh, the, uh, uh, most of the women, when they are around 50, start having issues with the cycles. And it is not like the... I mean, menopause as a, as a clinic uh, concept means that you have been one year without a period. Okay, because it's not uh, uncommon that some patients may not have a period for three, four, five months and then suddenly have two periods. And this is another period called climaterium, which stay, which uh, lasts like two years or something like that until you are absolutely and completely menopausal. Okay, uh, yeah, when I say scan, it was meaning an, an ultrasound. Okay, and basically uh, that's something that you has, that you must do when you are about to start the treatment, because the fact, as I've said, 
that the last cycle you had was only two months ago does not mean that probably in four or five months you may have another period. And if that happens when the donor is on the way for the egg collection, it would be a disaster because we would have to freeze all the embryos. So the only thing that we can do in these cases is take control of your cycle, as I've said, by putting you on a contraceptive pill. So if you want to start the egg donation route, the only thing is that before starting the synchronization, you need to repeat the scan, the ultrasound, confirm that everything is quiet, that there is no activity, that the endometrium is uh, really thin. And if there is no activity, then you can start the pill and forget about your cycle. All right. Thank you so much for uh, that advice uh, again. Uh, very useful, I am sure. And as I mentioned, now we will go to our uh, final question for today. Um, just a second, though, it's right here, sorry. Uh, if you do a biopsy of the endometrium, what are you looking for? A lot of things. <laughs> you can check a lot of things. I mean, um, and the, the first thing is that you can do a pathology study to check if it's normal or not. Uh, you can also check uh, different new tests uh, like uh, a window of uh, implantation. You can check if the microbioma, which is the normal flora that should be in the, in the endometrium is correct or not. You can try to see if there is any bacterial DNA that suggests that you may be having a chronic uh, infection in the endometrium, a chronic asymptomatic endometritis that may impair the implantation. So there are different reasons that you can, for which you can be doing an endometrium biopsy. Um, what you're looking for depends on the clinical context, on the history of the patients, and also of what you get in the cycle. It could be different if you if you don't have a, a good thickness of the endometrium, you may be looking for uh, problems that has to do with the development of the endometrium. So quite a few, quite a few tests can be done on the endometrium. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for your time and for helping us out. Um, that was definitely very useful. And uh, well, thank you so much also for so many detailed answers. And uh, I just want to show you, we don't have any more questions. I believe that uh, we have explored all possible uh, topics. Mm -hmm. So that is good, uh, but I would like you to see that uh, there are some comments here. Uh, I am thank very you. I learned a lot about my situation, and uh, thank you so much for the rich information. Here's another one. So I just want you to see that um, definitely it was useful. Yes. Mm -hmm. So this is a great <laughs> question. <laughs> you. Exactly. That's that's what I wanted to it to be useful. That's what which is yeah. really important. Uh, exactly. So again, here's another one for you. Super useful, worth attending. I would love to have a doctor like you. So yes. You know where I am. You know where I am. Exactly. It's very easy. Exactly. <laughs> Remember that uh, you will be able to get in touch with uh, Dr. Olivares. You can also go to our uh, website uh, where you will be able to find exactly this um, event as well as you know it is being recorded so you will have a chance to uh, see it uh, again uh, and also um i just wanted to uh, just show you this information so sending also some love to all women here who already have gone through so much fertility problems thank you so much uh, i am sure so there are so many of uh, women right now that are struggling and so it's very important that you are all here gathering and that way you can simply also connect and know that you are not on your own so thank you for that comment mm -hmm. for sure uh well that will be uh, it for today um i'm just checking if there are any other uh, comments to to show you um okay there is one more so i just want you to to see it all Truly the clearer explanation I've ever had. <laughs> so uh, I guess there is nothing more to, to comment and uh, we come to see you after COVID. Well, 
That's that good to great. hear as well, right? Okay, um, thank you again, Dr. Raul. As you know, as you see, uh, many, many positive uh, comments, uh, many thank, uh, thanks to, to, your, um, to helping us out and supporting our uh, Stronger Together initiative. We are very happy uh, to have you here. Are there any, anything else you would like to add? No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm really happy that the, uh, the attendants have found uh, the, this useful. Sometimes it's very difficult, you know, with the limited amount of information that they have uh, to, to, to recommend, to be more precise about the recommendations. But as you said, um, whoever is interested uh, can get in touch with us and we will be happy. We, we, we are very used to treat patients from abroad and we have a really good structure and a good service. And if you want to contact us, feel free. We will be happy to help you. For sure. Perfect. Uh, so thank you again for joining us, for uh, being patient as well. And again, you can find all of our events on our website, myivfanswers.com. Uh, you can also register for our upcoming events. As you know, we will be here tomorrow, 6 p.m. UK time and also 8 p.m. UK time. So I uh, hope you will be able to join us as well. Have a good night, Dr. Raul. Have a good night to, to all of Same you. Same to course, you. Wherever My you best are. wishes. Stay safe. Exactly. Okay. Stay safe and take care. Thank you. Uh, you work. Good night. Bye-bye.